Hello everybody and welcome. My name is Solita Townsend and I am the co-founder of Futera and I am reading through the chat function of all those who are joining where everybody is introducing themselves. I'm seeing people from Germany, Finland, from the UK, from all across the US, from India, um, uh, more and more coming in. So please do take this time and introduce yourself in the chat function. Make sure you, that you're setting it to all panelists and attendees. So set it to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise only I can see it, which is wonderful, but I would love everybody to be able to see. So if you're introducing yourself, you set it to all panels and attendees, all panel and attendees. I'm seeing folks coming in from Brazil, from Hyderabad, um, from Paris, from Brazil, so many. Remember all, pa all panelists and attendees. Oh, how amazing to see all these people joining. How wonderful to be part of our community here. Um, it gives me a real amazing sense of connection to see all of those names, all of those passionate change makers from Taiwan joining. Uh, I can't even read them all from, um, from France, from Germany. Um, it's wonderful to see so much enthusiasm and so many participants. So a couple of pieces of housekeeping just as we get started. Um, in this all panellists and attendees, make sure you've set your chat to all panellists and attendees. If it's just set to panellists, it's only three of us on here who can see. In order for everybody to see, you need to uh, set your chat to all attendees. That's the place for us all to talk to each other in the chat function to panellists and attendees. If you want to ask a question, you need to press the Q&A button. Press the Q&A button on the screen. And that's where the questions for myself and for the other panelists um, will be posted. We've got some amazing panelists today to talk to you and an incredible subject, which is so close to all of our hearts. Um, and I'm just gonna keep reminding everybody that you are currently being recorded for all of those who have signed up but are on a time zone that aren't able to make it. I'm just going to start and kick us off before we go to our panellists with just a few thoughts from Futera um, uh, around this subject of sustainable lifestyles in this extraordinary, extraordinary moment. So uh, many of you will know Futera, in fact you will have, uh, you will have ha had your invitation from us, otherwise forward from, some, um, from another. Futera is the change agency. Our mission is to make sustainability so desirable it becomes normal. And that's got such a core meaning when we talk about sustainable lifestyles, because sustainable lifestyles are either necessary and unavoidable, or they're desirable and something which we want. And Futera has a long history of working on the subject of sustainable behaviours um, with our clients, with our corporate clients, um, uh, with our NGO partners, um, with governments and publics. Um, so from working with the United Nations on the Good Life Goals, if you don't know the Good Life Goals, they are a translation of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals into actions that individuals can take because we powerfully firmly believe in Futera. There's a role for individuals as well as for institutions in creating change. So those 17 good life goals are what us as individuals can do to fulfill the sustainable development goals. To the big brands, big impact marketers guide to behavior change that we produced as part of the sustainable lifestyles frontier group with BSR. Through to the honest product work we've done around how people are changing what they buy and how they interact with the consumer goods forum and the Futera Changemaker cards, which are a direct um, guide to how your organisation, be it a business, a brand or an NGO, how your organisation um, can change behaviour. Now, there's a great deal of resources across all of that, which you can download from wearefutera.com. But what's going on right now in this weird, extraordinary moment that we're all going through, this weirding, this pause, this pivot, 
that I very much hope that you're facing well and then your families are doing well within. And we know there are many that are not. And um, thoughts going out to those online who may have been having challenges or know those who have. Within our own organisations, within our own supply chains, we know that there is a great deal of challenge, economic, social, emotional, that are going on right now. So where is sustainability in this? Whilst all of our lives, billions of lives worldwide, have turned upside down. Well, what I wanted to share with you is a little bit of hot off the press market research. So Futera works with a partner called One Pulse. One Pulse is a, a, a pulse taking market research company. So this is an in-depth uh, qualitative research. This is short, sharp pulse quant research. And we asked in the last hour, so that's in the last 60 minutes, we asked 150 people in the UK and 150 people in the US the same question. And we did them in the UK and the US just because it's in English and we had to do it in the last hour. We asked, should we make as many big lifestyle changes to stop climate change as we're making to stop coronavirus. And remember, this is not urban populations, this is not young populations. This is a representative, if a small one, a rep representative sample of those online and able to answer the question. 87% of Brits answered that yes, we should make the same big lifestyle changes to stop climate change as we're making to stop coronavirus. That shocked me, 84% of Americans, of, um, of folks in the USA, and that's across the states, said the same. It's extraordinary fi finding, but consistent with other survey findings that we're finding, quite large ones, around how people are putting the coronavirus and climate change especially together. We went on to ask, since the lockdown, since the pandemic, have you changed anything to live more sustainably or to be greener? And in the UK, 54% of folks saying it's a little very similar to the US, 55, about half of people saying yes, um, about 20% of people saying a lot, um, and about the equivalent, about 20% of people saying no. So again, very similar to what we see in any survey breakdown of about half of people being, should we say, soft greens or a bit into sustainability, about a quarter being very into it and about a quarter not being interested at all. So again, we're sharing these because although they're small sample sizes, they do reflect what we're seeing elsewhere. And then finally, we got a little bit specific and we asked in the near future, be that leaving lockdown or otherwise, in the near future, are you planning to change your lifestyle to be more sustainable? And again, very similar findings from the UK or the US, with, with one notable exception around traveling and bicycling. So we're noticing that in the UK, a great deal of people, about 40% of people, are planning to travel by foot and bicycle more. And we're seeing that across Europe as European cities notably begin to change, modal shift, begin to change some of their urban planning post lockdown to allow people to um, travel by foot and bicycle more, whereas in the US, much, much less so numbers of people planning to do so. But overall, the big choices, waste less, um, uh, but slightly larger in the US than, um, than in the UK in terms of people choosing to do that, and exercise more. Avoiding plastic packaging, um, eating less meat, surprisingly slightly more in the US and the UK, but again, that connecting with neighbours, not as much as we were expecting to see. Perhaps that might be a, a, a pandemic phenomena and not a long-term one. So I just wanted to share those few uh, immediate, just pulse takes. The, this isn't depth research, this isn't deep global quant or, um, or what have you, but it does give us a pulse of where people are. And that's one thing which I think all of us have found um, and which our panelists are about to share with us is perhaps this sense that more people are interested in, in this than otherwise might have been. Um, and I'm already seeing questions about what about flights, what about car journeys? Well, the travel by, by, by foot or bicycle was out around car. I'd love to ask about flights, um, but I decided to, um, to ask about meat instead in terms of controversial things I was asking about. All of this deserves great deal more, more study, but I, for one, am very, very encouraged about it. Now, with that, I'm gonna hand over to Lena. So uh, Lena is the Chief Sustainability Officer of the Inter-IKEA Group. She's just gonna say a few words to get us started around um, uh, what is IKEA seeing around sustainable lifestyles within this pandemic and where might they go next? And remember, please keep introducing yourself to all panelists and attendees in chat but if you have questions to ask 
please ask the questions in the Q&A function. Over to Lena. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. And in this very strange times, I'm inviting you to my home, I guess, since we many of us are working from home. Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to come together today and talk about how we actually can change and move towards the change we want to see. At the same time, we are in the middle of change. So it's, of course, very difficult to know what's actually going to happen and what we can take with us from this. But I would like to reflect on the fact that we work as a company with a vision that is to create a better everyday life for the many people. On top of that, our core knowledge and our core interest is to understand how people live, how they live at home, how they work, how they come together. So the whole kind of morning, how do you get up? How do you eat? How do you go to school? How do you work? How do you enjoy your friends? And all of that is now happening in the same space. We've actually come to a timing where almost all the cross function in a home is happening. You have work invited to your home. You have schooling and homeschooling in your home. You eat in your home and it's cross space everywhere. So with also the ambition, and as we've spoke with many times before, Solitaire, is to inspire and enable people to live healthy and sustainable lives. What does this mean? Uh, I think it's an amazing opportunity to actually look what is happening with people now. But then, of course, we don't know what is going to stick. What are the changes we're doing now that will be stick, stick for the future? There's also, of course, a tension. Many people want to leave their home and go outside now, and they're stuck in their home. So I think if we're going to look at the strengths and the possibilities to actually motivate the change to inspiring and enabling healthy living, we have a lot of learnings to do. And I think one of the things we can see is how people are coming together now and really acting on a cause with values in supporting each other. And the sort of crisis management, which is maybe short term, we hope, but it is coming together in changing for businesses to change supply chains. And uh, this is uh, our furniture suppliers today are pro making protective gear for uh, uh, hospitals. Uh, people in their communities are shopping for each other and, and helping the elderly to get food in their homes. Uh, and we're helping each other with schooling. So there's something what's happening with people now in the behavior that we could learn from also in the long-term perspective. Then, of course, if we look at the sustainable development goals to really make the change we want to see, it's a bit too early to actually now know what will stick with us. We know we learn a lot about the digital. We know that we shop differently right now. We know that we are connecting differently, but some of that will stay and some of it will, will most likely fall back because we also e are eager to get together again and meet. We've done a lot of research when it comes to life at home and sharing spaces and co-living. And I think what we can see now, if you look very short term, maybe the fact that people are buying office chairs and office uh, equipment and more, uh, more uh, activities for their children. That's sort of a short term change. Uh, it is gearing up your home to be able to be your home office. Um, but we also see some trends which we actually saw before even this pandemic happened. And that is, for example, if you ask people what is the most important thing in their life, almost 54% said that the most important, and I say not the important, the most important is the health and well-being with my family. And I think if you look at it now, you would probably get even a higher score on that. Uh, and then if you ask people, what is the barrier to actually get the most, the healthy and sustainable life you want for your family? Uh, expensive, it's too expensive and it's too complicated. And I think that stays with us. So if to, to actually move our healthy and sustainable living agenda, we need to make it affordable for everybody. And maybe now people are also falling back to poverty. So even more people need to have an affordable and easy solution. We could also see that people are taking care of their things. They want to make sure that they can repurpose their things and take care of it longer and much more contribute to a circular society. 
And I think that is also something that we can see now, taking care of the things and being cautious with resources, as well as looking into the climate agenda. So even if it's too early to actually see where we're going, I think it's an interesting topic today to stop a little bit and reflect to see what are we able to do when we change behaviors together, when we're actually everybody seeing the same crisis and seeing the same needs to change. Uh, that's the behavior that's happening today. Then we can also see what can we do to really collaborate together to make the change happen that we want to happen moving forward. And we know that we can probably lean to a lot of the insights we already know. We know that one of the barriers for sustainable living is that it's not accessible for all. We know that affordability and circularity can be very much hand in hand, and it's something we can work on together. We also know that the awareness of climate change is high and the visibility of climate change is high. So why not take the opportunity to transform into re renewable uh, society and really take the climate steps that we need to do. And when it comes to healthy and sustainable living and the well-being, never been so important, I think. And now it's also the opportunity to take the full scope of that, really looking into our behaviors and see what we can do. So I think it's too early to know what is happening with us now, but I do think we have a possibility to join together and find the affordability and the solutions that we would like for people to have. Because I would always stay to say that we need to keep connected and hopefully also in a physical way in the future. But there is something with sustainable living is that it needs to be fun. It needs to be inspiring, but it also needs to be seamless. Nobody wakes up in the morning and say, I am going to do this for the planet. Uh, maybe a few and hopefully many on this call. But most people will wake up and say, I need to feed my children. I need to go to school. I need to work. And then the sustainable living should be part of that. And that's what we are now looking into, of course, to see what kind of partner IKEA can be in that change. So that would be my reflection. And I really hope we can join together. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lena. And um, thank you for sharing that. And thank you particularly for bringing in the issue around accessibility and affordability, because that's been part of the inter IKEA group's commitment around sustainable lifestyles all the way through, the many people, giving access to the many people. And of course, this issue right now around equality and access and who is an essential worker and, 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 and the rights to work and the rights to life and the rights to ways of living is such a huge part of the conversation right now so thank you for bringing it in because it always should have been part of the sustainability conversation and i think right now it's an unavoidable part of that um, i'm going to move on i'm just before i hand over to kate i'm just going to remind everybody if you're introducing yourself in the chat make sure that it's set to all panelists and attendees if it's just set to all panelists there's only four of us who will see it if you set your chat to all panelists and attendees everybody will see it but also to remember i won't be taking questions from the chat that's for us to all talk to each other i'll be taking questions from the q a button so if you want to um please press q a several people have asked whether a recording of this will be available afterwards the answer is yes it, we're all being recorded um, and if you registered for the webinar then that recording will be available to you afterwards so just a little bit of housekeeping there um which is probably not the most glamorous introduction to kate Rams, the uh, a giggle sustainability officer um again thank you so much for joining us both you and lena um a great friends of hotel and clients and we are so pleased to have you as part of this debate um i know that technology wise um, we will bring up your slides now um, and just give a little nod when you want us to press forward so over to you Kate thank you so much Sully it's such a pleasure to be here and, and Lena great to be joining you as well and, and all of you who are joining us um, from home thank you for, for tuning in um, certainly couldn't be a more relevant topic for today so excited for the discussion I thought I might just begin by sharing a little bit about how we think about sustainability at Google, particularly in this moment, and then how that is very deeply tied to our desire to help everyone live more sustainably, and then how that's become an even more topical and relevant aspect of our work in these last several months and weeks here. 
But um, just by way of introduction, so our, our mission at Google for our sustainability program is to strive to build sustainability into everything that we do. And I'll have the next slide, please. And this is our five-year sustainability strategy. And of course, um, I'm sure many of us on the call have gone through this process of, of building a long-term sustainability strategy. And, and we always work to make them evergreen and as future-proof as possible. Uh, and, and we did this work in, in 2018 in what feels like a, a very different world. But I have to say, I still think this very much holds true for us, even if as we look at the current global pandemic and you know, hopefully a future where we're rebuilding with resilience. Um, so these are the three core areas that we look at within our program. Accelerating carbon free and circular, empowering with technology and benefiting people and places. And this cuts across all the work that we do within both Google's operations, our supply chains, as well as how we think about using our technology to empower everyone. I'll have the next slide, please. And for us at Google, sustainability also starts at home. Um, we have had very long standing commitments to how we operate sustainably. And, and we were just able to share a few weeks ago on Earth Day that for the third year in a row, we've matched 100% of our electricity use with renewable energy. Um, and why this is important is not only because it's about responsibly managing our own operations, but it also directly translates to the products that we're able to offer all of our users around the world. I'll have the next slide, please. Because we are 100% renewable and carbon neutral in Google's operations, this also means uh, that our products are all carbon neutral as well. So whether they're, you're using um, you know, G Suite and Meet at home right now to do your work or, you know, watching videos on YouTube about how to be more sustainable at home. Um, all of those products are carbon neutral as well. I'll have the next slide, please. But as I said, you know, for us, this isn't just about our operations or even how we can deliver products to our users sustainably. It's also uh, very much about the role of our technology and how we can build technology that empowers everyone to build a more sustainable world. And one of the areas where we've been very focused on this for a long time is through our geo platform. We have been working with researchers and environmental organizations for over a decade to enable insights through data. I'll have the next slide, please. And in this time, this has again become incredibly relevant we have one of our core platforms is called Google Earth Engine. And what we found is that like scientists and researchers have been doing on many topics for many years, in this time of COVID, when there are so many interesting insights to be gained around air quality, we have been seeing people building those insights on top of Google Earth Engine. And what you're seeing here is data from a group called Earther that they built on Earth Engine. And these were some of the early maps that were showing changes in air quality globally uh, during the pandemic. So really critical insights that we're very proud to be able to help scientists and researchers produce. I'll have the next slide, please. And also, you know, we think about policymakers in this time where policymakers are more important than ever in driving change. Uh, we want to inform them with data that is decision useful and that can help in the development of climate action plans, and now as we look ahead, hopefully soon to COVID recovery, how we can think about recovering differently. So what you're seeing here on the slide is a tool at, called the Environmental Insights Explorer that we've partnered with the Global Covenant of Mayors to build. This tool is currently available for over 100 cities around the world, and it provides unique Google data on building emissions, transportation emissions, and the solar potential of rooftops. So what we've already seen is cities um, here in the US from San Jose to Houston are setting new climate targets based on the confidence they get from this data. And as we look ahead, we're very interested in thinking about could this tool be useful to cities as they think about building back better, building back differently. You know, we know that people don't want things to go back to the way they were. And so we're very eager to think about how can we utilize our tools and platforms to give cities the insights they need to do that. I'll have the next slide, please. 
And uh, as, as you probably saw in the invitation for today, you know, this was a really important consumer insight and very much dovetails with Sully, your, your quick poll that you were sharing at the top, um, which is that we, we received this very important insight that we shared on Earth Day. So this is reflecting you know, the 90 days uh, leading up to April 22nd. We saw something really noteworthy search interest in how to live a more sustainable lifestyle increased by over 4,000%. And for us, this was a really critical insight because we were already very keen to give people more helpful information for how to live more sustainably before the pandemic. But now knowing that as people are spending more time at home, this is even more top of mind, even more important. This becomes a huge opportunity for all of us and we really wanna to contribute to that through Google. I'll have the next slide, please. So some of the ways that we're doing this are through tools like Project Sunroof. This is available um, around the world, not in every country, but increasingly across Europe and the US and coming to more places soon. What Sunroof enables you to do is very simply type in your address and see based on Google Earth 3D imagery, so the shading and orientation of your roof, to see if your roof is a good candidate for solar and then to take the next step to getting solar on your rooftop. Another example is, if I could have the next slide, please. The Google Assistant for Recycling. Um, we know particularly while we're all at home and cooking more, we're constantly asking ourselves, is this tin, is this bottle recyclable where I live? Um, and what we know is that people really feel motivated to recycle, but they often don't know what the rules are um, in their particular jurisdiction or hometown. And so we've tried to make that much more simple. So, so now you can ask your Google Assistant, okay, Google, can I recycle this bottle? Or can I um, you know, put, put this piece of tin foil into the recycling? And you will get a response back from your Google Assistant. And I can have the next slide, please. And then, of course, Nest. Our Nest learning thermostat um, has been in people's homes dating back to 2011, helping them save energy and save money on their utility bills. And we were able to share last month a pretty huge milestone, which is that 50 billion kilowatt hours of cumulative energy savings have been generated for our customers since Nest went onto the market. And this has also enabled over $3 billion of savings on utility bills. So again, a really great example of helping people live more sustainably and saving, saving money on their utility bills. I'll have the next slide, please. And Your Plan, Your Planet is in many ways our, our biggest foray into the space of giving people really science-based information about how to live more sustainably at home. This is a tool that we built with the California Academy of Sciences, our science museum here in San Francisco, along with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And it's based on the very basic premise that as individuals, our greatest impacts on the planet are how we use energy, how we use water and food waste. And so what this tool offers is gamified, fun ways of learning how to reduce your impact across those categories. Um, and people loved using it so much at home with their kids, we ended up building a companion curriculum as well that goes with your plan, your planet that's on our Google Teacher Center. So particularly in this time where so many people are at home with the kids um, and we have so much learning happening from home, this is a great tool for people to share with their families and for educators to be able to use in their classrooms. I'll have the next slide, please. And then of course there's YouTube. You know, many of us turn to YouTube for how to's on all manner of things, but including living more sustainably. And so we've partnered with our team at YouTube, uh, particularly for Earth Day to curate some content that is helpful for people who are asking themselves these very, very basic sustainability questions like how do I compost or how do I fix my furniture? Um, and so, you know, check out all the great resources there, but we really think this is another great platform for giving people helpful information at home. And then lastly, you know, another insight that we've had is as so many of us around the world are sheltering in place, we don't have the opportunity to visit some of our most special places outside our national parks, our world heritage sites. 
So we also want to provide people with ways to connect with the beauty and majesty of nature from home. So we've curated several different tours, um, both for U.S. national parks as well as World Heritage sites around the world, where you can virtually visit a park, take a tour with a park ranger, and even have a sort of street view level experience of, you know, what would it be like to be on a hike or even relive hikes that you may have taken um, before shelter in place. So these are just a few examples. I, I think I completely agree with Lena. You know, we're, we're certainly at the beginning, not at the end of gaining insights into what this moment will mean for all of us. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation. I think there's tremendous lessons to be gained from this time. And I'm very hopeful about the role that technology can play in helping people live more sustainably now and into the future. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank you for giving us that insight in terms of the role that technology can play right now um, and into the future. At Futera, we're sort of looking at this in the past, the pivot and the possible. So just to remind ourselves that we're living in a pivotal moment, that this pause that we're in um, is not going to continue as it is, but when we come out of it, we will be in a different place. And it's up to us how far that pivot goes and, and what we pivot towards. We have got so many questions coming in. So I'm gonna try and fast shoot through quite a few of them. And I'm gonna try particularly to ask the ones which are to both of you, if I can. So the first one, and actually this goes right to the core of what we were talking about, which is, is a sustainable lifestyle for everyone? Is it something which can be accessible by everyone? So Ilian Clark has asked, is it really possible for a sustainable lifestyle to be affordable and sustainable? Or is there always going to be this trade-off that the most sustainable options are available for those who can afford it? I'd love to come to Lena for that first because she raised it and then I'll come to Kate. I think that's a very good uh, question and it's one of the ones that I think is the most important one. Uh, a sustainable lifestyle and a healthy sustainable lifestyle is accessible for everybody. I think that that is the most and biggest ambition we have. Then, of course, we're not there yet. Uh, I would add that in many places. And I think it also is in, you know, a time perspective. So if you go out today and you would say that, that the sustainable lifestyle is for everybody, you would not see that. I mean, you would come to uh, the more sustainable choices in some cases, which is the most expensive uh, choice. But if you actually look into the supply chain, and if, if you actually look with the whole product development, to be sustainable, you actually need to be extremely resource efficient. Uh, and in some cases you need to change and maybe that investment in change is a short term where it actually has a price uh, increase but that's where companies like IKEA has to work on you know because it should be affordable and accessible for everybody so I think that there is many many choices today that are possible to live both healthy and sustainable that is also affordable but it's far away from enough yeah, brilliant I, I, thank you so much Absolutely. I, yes, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I, I think it is possible. I think it's what we all need to be working towards. And I think we have more work to do. Um, but certainly that has very much been at the core of, of some of the tools that I shared. And I think particularly your plan, your planet, which is very much focused on how do we help people live more efficiently and more sustainably. And, you know, some of the tips we share there are things like turning down your hot water heater just a few degrees can save you a lot of energy, but also reduce your utility bill. Similarly, um, with water, you know, actually if using your dishwasher and not washing dishes by hand reduces your water use, reduces your water bill. So I think that there are opportunities that we have today that are very clear and simple where we can align um, these interests. And I think we have more work to do to make it accessible on a broad scale. Brilliant, thank you, Kate. I'm gonna keep popping with these questions. I had a whole load prepared, but I'm afraid the ones which are coming in are much better, so I'm going to go with those. So you and Murray has asked a lot of questions, but one of the questions is asked is something which is very similar to the ones that others are asking, which is when we talk about sustainable lifestyles, we almost always assume that we're nudging or helping to give the public choices which will help them become more sustainable. Um, but is that the right way that we should do it? Shouldn't we just be building in the sustainable right up front? Should we just simply be offering more sustainable products and services and with withdrawing products and services that aren't sustainable um, rather than trying to rely on behavior change. So is it built in 
or behavior change. I'm going to come to Kate for that first and then to Lena. I'm going to swap it out as we go through. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that built in has uh, often wider, you know, success of adoption. And for example, I think the Nest learning thermostat is a great example of that. You know, yes, Nest saves energy and money, but it's also just a better experience. You can turn up or down your air or your heat, you know, from the bed, from anywhere in your home. Um, it's both a better experience as a user as well as driving more sustainability. So I, I think where we can align a better user experience with more sustainable outcomes, we're winning. But also I think, Philly, as, as your data shows and as our Google Trends Insights show, people actively want to be involved. And I think that's important. And I, and I do think in this moment where people want to see this change, they want to play a proactive role. So I also think doesn't necessarily need to be a nudge, but how do we be helpful as people are seeking these insights, as people want to make change in their life, how do we meet them where they are and provide them those helpful insights? So I think it's both. Brilliant. Thank you. Lena. Oh, well, I think there's two dimensions to it as well, because I think there's one part, which is when you talk about a function like energy efficiency or water saving or uh, even waste reduction, well, then there is always two parts. There is the built-in part that can happen automatically, but there is also a behavior part of making choices. But if you talk about the most sustainable choice that is just built into the product, that is the materials and, the, and how you actually design products for circularity to be refurbished and repurposed, then it should just be built in. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that we often look for the sort of flagship products uh, and the, the icon products, the product that has the green dot on it. But if you actually look at the biggest and most change that you can do is to look at all the products at the same time and do the shift so that all materials and, and that's been the strategy behind the sustainability within IKEA is that if you look at the cotton products today it's all products all cotton that come from more sustainable sources you don't have one product that you can buy uh, if you look at forest uh, products and wood-based products it's all that is certified it's not one otherwise it becomes uh, strange uh, in one way so the built-in should be for everything the function that is there needs to have a behavior and a built-in function. Thank you, Lena. Um, I'm actually going to come back to Lena to build off that. Um, I'm, I'm dual tracking it, I'm reading questions and listening to you and actually there's been a lot of questions that in some ways relate to that, which is um, we're talking around um, sometimes there being the green products or not the green products. Um, but this isn't just an issue of products, this is an issue of business model. So Diana Davidson and Jackie Mackay and various others have asked, um, do we need to be looking at different models, different commercial models, at renting rather than ownership models? Um, and in a Perhaps you could talk a little bit to how IKEA's done that. And then for Kate, I'll ask you to build on that from the role of technology. It may be sort of enabling us to do, to do much more whilst perhaps there being simply less stuff. So uh, over to Lena, what, 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 what are the innovative models we can bring to helping people live more sustainably? Yep, that's a good one. And I think there is, of course, big changes and that it has to happen and is ongoing right now. Uh, the first starting point is to see, is the product that you're providing today actually making life better for people? Uh, and uh, if, if it's not, maybe you should question your business model. And, uh, and what we're thinking about today is that if you need to sleep and you need a bed and you need a table and you need a kitchen, we still think that there is a role for IKEA. So that was our starting point. Um, but then with that goes the business model as you just spoke about. If we're gonna transform into a circular society, we need to look at every aspect of the business model and not just the leasing part. That's just a financial solution. You actually need to redesign the products. So all products needs to be redesigned to be repurposed, re, re Re, uh, repaired uh, and, and also be recycled at the end. But you also have to have the services around it, as you say, maybe leasing, maybe it's another service around it. And also you need to have a solution at the end. So you need to look at the total flow of prolonging materials and products in society. And especially for a retail industry, this is probably one of the biggest moves that we have to do. Thank you, Lena. Over to Kate. 
Yes, uh, indeed. And I, I think just to build on that, you know, we, we do see, uh, you know, I think Lena, you and I share a great passion for the circular economy. And, you know, something that, that we, we have said is that we very much see circular economy as in part a data problem and that technology has a critical role to play in unlocking data and insights that can be both helpful for designing new products, designing new materials, um, but also understanding where our stuff is, how do we get it back? Um, or even on a more basic level, just how do we repair it? You know, I was giving the YouTube example and I'm sure we've all gone on YouTube to assemble our IKEA furniture or figure out how to fix it. Um, so I think there's both, you know, much more high tech solutions, like how do we use AI to find more sustainable materials that will be better for our products of the future and also just solutions that are very much available to everyone today. Like how do we keep our stuff longer by repairing it at home? Brilliant. And that, um, uh, that builds into uh, a bit of a question, particularly around, uh, oh, I, yeah, actually, let me ask you first of all, because Vic, Vicar and Seth asked a really good question. Um, and it's one that's reflected in a lot of the comments, which is, what are we allowed to talk about and not allowed to talk about when it comes to a sustainable lifestyle? Is voting part of a sustainable lifestyle? Is political action part of a sustainable lifestyle? Is teaching your kids part of a, life, a sustainable lifestyle? If you go and take a look at the good life goals, which are the translation of the SDGs into individual action, there's actually a lot of those actions are not, should we say, consumer action. Actions. They are actions as a parent, actions as a citizen. Um, and I remember back in the day, back in the many, many decades ago, when I started um, uh, in sustainability, the rule was you couldn't talk to people about meat or about air travel. So where do you think the edge of this sustainability conversation is? In IKEA, in Google, are, are you having conversations about some of these controversial parts of sustainable lifestyle around helping to change people's flying or well, not that that's changed significantly at the moment helping to engage people in their political action enable them to um to vote in the places where they can helping people to change some of their food consumption is that a conversation that you're having internally or is that always waiting perhaps for the public to come first and for then to enable them once that sort of attitude shift has happened i'm going to come to kate first with that one she'll be really thankful for me coming to her first on that one so of course, no, I, I think it's an excellent question. And I, I think for me, the way that, that I think about it is, is this comes back to why I do think it's so important to help people take action. You know, as I was saying, I think in this moment, yes, built in sustainability is an important thing to strive for, but also people want to be more involved. People are scared. They want change. They want the world to look different when we recover from COVID. We need to empower them to do that. And that is something you know, that we're very passionate about is how do we provide people with that helpful information and actually engage them as individuals, as parents, as people that are cooking dinner at home every night, maybe for the first time in a long time. Um, and I think with that, you, you enable people to take action. Then people are thinking about what is, not only what does this mean for me at home, but how does this influence how I want to vote in my next election? How does this influence what business I want to you know, consume from, I want to be, you know, part of their supply chain. Um, so I, I think that this is why it is so important to not ignore the value of individual action, of empowering individuals to be involved, because there has, there are so many important knock-on effects that come with that, of people being more civically engaged, people being more informed um, consumers. So that's really how we think about it. Thank you, Kate. Lena? I think I think that it's really important to, to not lose out who you are in this conversation. And we've had many, many discussions on this in the sense of, you know, we're a home furnishing company. Uh, we are being invited to millions of people's home because you're bringing home the products that we have put our touch on. Uh, and we can inspire and enable you to live a healthy and sustainable live, but a life. But we shouldn't tell you how to live your life uh, because that's, that would also become more of a authority uh, role, which I mean, we are part of your community. We are part of developing these things together and we would like to act on things that are good for our communities together, just like now mobilizing in a crisis situation. But also when we look into sustainable lifestyles, we can share our knowledge in home furnishing. We can uh, share our knowledge in life at home, but we're not, not telling people how to live their lives 
and, and also making sure that we know that people can teach us a lot too. So I think there is a important role here to really know how to interact and, and also be sure that in a sustainable lifestyle, you need to be inspired and not be told. That, that inspiration aspect, that how do you inspire people actually relates to a lot of questions we're having about renewable energy. Mm. So both Kate at, um, at Google and Lena at Into IKEA, you are huge purchasers um, of renewables and low carbon energy, massively committed to it um, uh, uh, in, in Google's um, case such such a global commitment um, to it and you've got a whole set of consumers who are currently using so much energy working from home in Lena's case so all these all these people their home energy use is going through the roof and in Kate's case it's going through the roof because we're using all your products <laughs> so um, in that inspire or enable what can you do to help people make that big lifestyle shift which is shifting to a different energy provider or getting your energy renewably, micro-renewables or elsewhere in your own home. I'm going to come to mm. Lena for that first. Mm. No, I, I mean, the, the whole climate agenda, of course, we are also working with the science-based target where we work on both scope one, two and three. And if we look at that from our point of view, of course, the biggest one is in scope three. About 40% of our own climate footprint is in the material we use. So the investment and the change in our supply chain, in our materials and our suppliers is an enormous footprint uh, change, um, uh, which actually then when we look at people's homes becomes very small. But then that thing is small, of course. So inspiring to uh, have home solar is one part of uh, what the AKS uh, retail industry is uh, inspiring about, but also to look into all the energy efficiency of the products of course but I think it's important in the lifestyle to show also what you do you inspire by show, by doing uh, and we are investing heavily in changing scope 3 and making our biggest footprint become uh, climate positive uh, and at the same time we are developing the products that are energy uh, using or consuming um, more energy efficient uh, and then, of course, inspire people to also think about energy efficiency and the solar panels in their home. So again, a little bit, take the full scope and show what you do, because what you do can also inspire others. Brilliant. Thank you. So, same question to Kate. We're all using the tech at the moment. How, how do we use that better? Yes, absolutely. You know, I shared a little bit in my presentation, you know, this has been a deep commitment of Google's uh, for a long time. We're the only major company who has been carbon neutral for 13 years. Um, we're the only major company to have matched 100% of our renewable and 100% of our energy use with renewables for the last three years. And we're the largest corporate purchaser of renewable energy. And of course, we do that not only because we want to operate responsibly, but also because it directly translates to our products. That means the products we're all using at home right now are carbon neutral. Um, and also it means that we're able to green grids around the world. We're able to drive increased renewable energy access for everyone through our being a large scale for serve renewables. And we're sharing those lessons. We're partnering with other businesses to ensure through groups like Reva, the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, that we're getting you know, 60 gigawatts of renewable energy on the grid, not just the five plus that Google has. Um, and then furthermore, we're helping to drive policy change. So this is where corporations can have a very large voice in partnering with policymakers and pushing on these issues and ensuring we're greening grids. So I think that's the more macro context. But then there's also the what are we enabling people to do in their homes? And, and I've also touched on this a little bit, which is first, of course, we know energy efficiency is critical. We want to enable people to be more energy efficient. So whether that's the really easy tips we're sharing, we're sharing in your plan, your planet, like turning down your hot water heater or our net learning thermostat that's saving people um, over $3 billion on energy bills and over 50 billion kilowatt hours of energy. Um, and also tools like Project Sunroof that I mentioned that have enabled uh, people to make informed decisions about going solar at home and find, connecting with providers in their communities. So I, we're looking at it at both scales, both at a macro scale, what we can drive, how we can partner with corporations, how we work with policymakers, but also what we can enable people to do in their lives at home. Let's lean into that policymaker piece. We've got so many questions coming in from Ruby Fowler, from Noah Steiner, from others around, you know, is this 
bottom up is this people power we've seen from your search in, information from and um, that you shared the massive increase of four four thousand percent increase in searches for sustainable lifestyle from even that tiny little survey that we did as Futera today looking that 80 percent of people think that we should be making as big changes in our life for climate change as we are um for corona so, so we've got this sort of huge upswell but isn't there also the need for some kind of top down some actual legislation some policy changes um, to enable people to live more sustainably even on small things we've seen that from um, uh, putting a price on plastic bags in certain places and reducing sometimes the big gulps um, in um, in, um, in places around health we see that that are and, and even smoking bans in many countries um, indoors we say that see that after a while perhaps if there are first movers from us as publics perhaps there's a tipping point at which you do need the policy change to actually drive the behavior change to become should we say the new normal as we're all living in a new normal now do we need that policy change for a new normal for sustainability i'm going to come to lena with that Absolutely. And I, I think, I mean, as we change and we are changing, there will also be um, barriers that are based on old systems. It could be anything from, you know, transporting waste to become a new resource. All of a sudden there is a different type of waste legislations that needs to change. Um, there is a testing methodologies that it puts a barrier to use and prolonged materials that needs to change. Um, there is also making it easier for people to repair things and, and, and be able to prolong the life of products. That there's so many um, uh, charging stations for electrical vehicles and they're, they're, you, the whole infrastructure around sustainable living needs to also be a collaborative approach with governments and bigger businesses uh, together with people on the bottom up uh, part. So I, I think uh, you're very spot on the fact that this is a change that needs to be a dance with many <laughs> in, the, so in, in the, the possibility to, to make the shift. And, and if, uh, if the um, infrastructure around policies can support that and accelerate that change, uh, it's fantastic. And that, that needs to happen. Thank you. I mean, it's not my question, just so you know, it's about 50% of the questions that we've got coming in are about this need for consumer behavior change, for public behavior change mm. to be matched with policy change. So coming to Kate on that. Yes, I, you know, I, I, I certainly agree, and I think, you know, we we need everyone's engagement, right? I, this is, I, I truly believe this remains our decisive decade on climate. We may have gotten sort of a, a brief reprieve on carbon this year, but we, you know, action is critical, and the level of action that's required in the next ten years requires everyone. It requires businesses like Google and IKEA. It requires policymakers, and it requires individuals. And as I said, I think there's an important and ideally virtuous cycle between all of those that if you inspire people, if you give them helpful information, they then want to engage, they want to be a more informed consumer, they want to be a more informed citizen. Um, so I, I think I think all of these pieces are critical and I, I agree with Lena that there's important policy measures um, that need to be taken to build a more circular world to drive greater adoption of clean energy and, and Sully, you mentioned um, some, and I think also important to note that some of them can be incentives based too. They don't all, they don't all have to be sort of bans or charges. They can also be incentives based, you know, rebates on electric vehicles, on energy efficient thermostats, et cetera. So I think we have to look at the full toolkit. We need to put the force of everyone behind this. Brilliant. Um, we're, we're running towards um, towards the end. I'm posting the questions um, as they come in. Um, we've had a lot of questions about the right now, about the pivot. We've been talking quite a lot about what changes over time, what you know, where we might reach to in terms of a sustainable lifestyle. But right now, whilst we've got issues around occupancy, where we've got a great deal of um, of inequality in terms of how people are experiencing the different lockdowns around the world, some people nice big house nice big workspace nice big garden others whole families um, uh, uh, in apartments or indeed people who are struggling to access housing at all um, and then the ongoing social distancing the ongoing social distancing that we're that it looks likely that many of us are going to maintain how can brands and businesses and actually thinking about your own business but also beyond how can technology how can actual physical materials how can they help us 
live with this lockdown because we have to we have to live with this lockdown. we have to live with the social distancing for the sake of others and of ourselves how can businesses really help with this mass behavior change we often talk about behavior change and sustainability we're going through a huge behavior change right now how can brands best serve that behavior change right now and in the moment so coming to lena I think, uh, I mean, this is one of the most serious questions I would say at the end here, because I, uh, it's one of the interesting aspects, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are all experiencing this at the same time uh, in one respect. There is, of course, some delays in, in, in outbreaks, but it is the same year and we're all looking and, and experience something very similar, but with, of course, very different uh, uh, situations, uh, how to deal with that. Um, both, as you said, with uh, you know being able to have a big house or actually uh, having no house at all. Uh, so uh, I think that it's a very challenging question to answer on a general level. Uh, what you can do as a global company is, of course, to um, be close as you can uh, locally and see how you engage and have community engagement and reach in that from uh, making sure that you are also part of that community. Uh, from a more global point of view, uh, we are still who we are and we can still provide solutions uh, for your home space uh, uh, and, and make sure that uh, your home space is as good as possible. Um, but then again, I think it's also on the bigger level and the whole kind of, you know, making switches in supply chains and making uh, supporting our own employees in order to get into the communities so it happens on so many levels and i think helping people will have to be very localized mm. thank you lena on to kate yes you know I, I think Sully, we we've talked about this recently but you know I, i'm very thoughtful about we're still very much in, in the middle of this crisis and i i think um, you know, the implications will be large and felt for a long time, and we're only really beginning to understand the insights that we can gain and, and you know, what role we can play as businesses. But I, I think to your point in terms of the here and now, you know, I, I go back to some of what I shared in, in my presentation, you know, we see a huge role for technology to be playing today to enable people to stay connected through you know, video platforms, to be connected to family, to be connected to colleagues, um, to give them helpful information for how they can live more sustainably at home, and also to keep people connected to the outside world, to be able to take virtual trips um, to you know, whether that be some of our most beautiful and special you know, parks and World Heritage sites, or just to some of our favorite cities that we can't visit anymore. So I, I think for us, th those feel like immediate opportunities in addition to what I shared about how we can enable scientists who are getting you know, just such unbelievable insights as to what happens with such dramatic stoppages of economic activity. You know, that's not how we wanna solve these issues, but because we're in this moment, we can gain really important insights into how, how, the, how the earth heals and in what ways it can heal quickly and what ways it doesn't. So again, providing you know, data and tools that can enable the scientific insights. So I think that's what we know today, much more to come you know, in the weeks and months to follow. Yeah, thank you, Kate. So I'm about to ask both of you um, a very final question, and it's my question. <laughs> We've had so many questions that have come in, but it's the question that I always ask, because as you both know, having worked with Futera for a long time, we are on, we are absolutely relentless optimists. We are always focused on what the good outcome could be because we feel that you have to be you have to be looking in the right direction for your feet to stay on the right path. And that if you look down or towards the negative too much, then you can uh, uh, accidentally walk towards it. So today, um, uh, Rutger, Rutger Brenman's new book, um, Humankind, has been published. Um, and I wrote an article on Forbes um, about this, just search um, Humankind and Climate, and it comes up quite high. And his premise is that actually human beings are good. And the news media, particularly social media, um, tends to focus on the bad bits of being human beings. And of course, there's, there's, there's that aspect to us as well. Um, but the, what we end up seeing is only the bad bits. And we forget that actually overall we're good. We are good people. We are decent people. And most of us are prepared to do the right thing. And in many cases, in many ways, what we're seeing with lockdown right now is proving that. We've all seen the stupid images of people who are breaking it, but overall, the big boring truth is we're doing it. We're changing our lives. We're 
turning everything up upside down in order to protect the most vulnerable within our societies we are doing the good thing and that gives me enormous hope for sustainability and that perhaps we should be starting on the premise that people are good and telling them how they can be good rather than starting on the premise that they're bad that I somehow need to be made better so that's what gives me enormous hope is the fact that actually human beings are basically good and they want others to be good and that the bad is the exciting unusual rather than the boring normal so i'm going to come to lena very quickly and ask you what gives you hope and then i'll give kate the last uh, word so over to lena what gives you hope for a sustainable <laughs> lifestyle no i think that uh, what gives me hope is the aspiration of something better uh, I think most people want to have something better and people want to have something that is good for their families and friends and more sustainable lifestyle is that we just need to be better to, to make the picture of what it means and how it contributes to it. So I, I think also to take the role be uh, and aspire for something together that gives me hope. Brilliant. Thank you, Lena. And on to Kate. Yeah, you know, I, I think I, I agree with you fully. I, I am also an optimist by nature and, and I, you know, I was incredibly moved and excited by the insight that we shared about even in this time of crisis, how much people are thinking about sustainability. And I, I you know, I feel very hopeful about the opportunity we have to, to meet people on that journey, to provide them with helpful information, to empower them to take those actions that they want to take to build a more sustainable world, not just for today, but for our children and grandchildren. So that gives me a lot of hope. Brilliant, thank you. And of course, the other thing that gives me hope is the hundreds and hundreds of people who have been online for the last hour, who are in the chat, who are in the Q&A. An hour is far too short to do this justice, but I really hope we've had an exciting and interesting and informative conversation for everybody. The Imagine Better series continues. Please do sign up. And I'm just going to give a massive, massive thank you to Lena and to Kate, to awesome women it's been my privilege to work with and um, thank you so very much and to everyone online all around the world please do enjoy your day and thank you for joining us goodbye everybody mm -hmm. <laughs>